Hi folks, um, it's Jeffrey Shaw here, and um, just above me is Alan McKinnon, and uh, he's here from Brisbane, and just directly below me is my co-host and friend, Julia Choi. As you can see, the dream in the new dream tonight is uh, for Koala's sake with Alan McKinnon. And um, Julia's actually, um, well, what's the best way? Meet and greet and discovered him and said, I think we should get this guy on the radio. And I think, well, we've had another fellow guy called Greg Chappell who came on um, last year. He was an animal whisperer. And I have to say, he was an awesome fellow. But this one is a bit different. Um, we're actually going to be talking everything associated with um, koalas. And I'm quite sure we're going to talk about other animals as well. So anyway, um, yeah, 7 o'clock, Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria. It's 9 o'clock in our friends in New Zealand, 10 o'clock in the morning in the UK. And um, for our friends in the United States who are still asleep, um, you can watch the show later. Good evening, Julia. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode of Dreaming in the New Dream. We're delighted to have Alan McKinnon join us. Alan McKinnon has dedicated at least 18 years of his life specifically to taking care of our furry and extra special <laughs> friends in Australia, the koala. And um, apart from the koala, uh, Alan has, is, is a trained, uh, qualified vet and um, actually started out life being the National Animal Welfare Manager in, for the New Zealand government. Um, while he was doing that, he got very interested in epidem epidemiology, uh, which is looking at new emerging diseases from wildlife, hendrovirus, lizard virus, and flying cock foxes, mad cow disease. And uh, we're very lucky to have um, Alan relocate from New Zealand to Australia. But I think that's actually a really good thing because New Zealand is actually at the forefront of taking care of mm -hmm. um, animals. And, uh, you know, they also declared a river to have legal person rights. So I think in this case, in this sector, Australians can actually learn a lot from New Zealand. So we're delighted to have Alan come onto the show and talk to us about the current plight of koalas and um, all the other animals that are facing extinction in Australia. <laughs> Welcome, Alan. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Great. So um, I guess, you know, I think last time I went to Europe, everyone was talking to me about the bush, what bush fires and um, mm -hmm. the one billion animals that got decimated. And since then, we still occasionally have headlines about um, where people are discussing whether corridors should be built for koalas that are being displaced by new development. You've worked at the forefront with orphans, koalas, koalas that are being picked up on the street, koalas that are being burnt. Um, and over the years, <clears throat> what, 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 how would you describe the situation that is faced by koalas in Queensland well, today? What, what, I've, what I find really interesting in this area is that um, we're very good at documenting what's happening but um, not but not taking the appropriate action so like we've got a lot of information about where the koalas are what their needs are and they're very specialized animals and they have very specific needs and if those needs aren't met well the populations are just 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 crashing and disappearing um, and so my having spent all that time patching up animals and putting them back into the wild it's like this feeling of like we we i can remember one particular case we had um we were treating in in the hospital and we it was there for probably six months by the time we went to re, to release it all the habitat had disappeared you know the the land where this animal lived um had been cleared and we're dealing with an animal that's highly territorial so you try and put it somewhere else, but it wants to go back to where it's come from. So um, because of the the special needs of koalas and because they're so um, specialised in what, in what they can feed on, um, it's very difficult to just go, oh, we'll put them somewhere else, we'll move them somewhere else, we'll, we'll, find, we'll find a better place for them because it just doesn't work that way. So what that comes down to is that we have to look at how can we protect their habitat and make sure they've got... A functioning habitat so that they can they can survive there. Well, I have to say, I was went for a little tiki tour. It's a New Zealand expression. On Sunday, down to um, 
the cane fields down here between Brisbane and the Gold Coast. And uh, when I came back out of the cane fields and I saw all these little enclaves, particularly in Pimpama, I could not believe the encroachment of suburbia and the massive buddy mm. um, warehouses, particularly in Bunnings and the shopping centres. And I'm thinking, geez, it's like 20 years ago that there's still cane fields. But I mean, mm. when you're talking about out past Ipswich and Camara and uh, further out, Ripley and places like that, and mm. and Spring um, Springfield, you can understand why they've been completely um, devastated. And, so and, th there's there's one statistic that's worth um, remembering, and that is like if you're going to have a viable population, you need need to have at least 500 animals so that you don't get sort of inbreeding and you know genetic defects. So if you've got a nice little habitat and you've got you've know, got your local population like 10 12 animals there you know they're not going to last you know, they can't they can't breed their way out of that so so what we're seeing is this fragmentation of the environment that that's really um that's really causing a lot of problems for for these animals and that's where you're saying because we came down on the pacific motorway and the highway mm. and you're saying that um Koalas just can't cross motorways very well. Well, human beings can't cross it, you know. Like, I wouldn't. I wouldn't try. No, that's mm. well, but uh, and that's why if they've been wiped out at that area. So, mm. so and koalas are creatures of habits. Yes. And um, they they will tend to walk through the same paths that they know. And you were actually telling us a good story about you know one of these developments coming up overnight and. The woman was in her in her living room, mm. and, it, and the door was open because it gets very hot here, and we just leave the doors open so that the wind can go blow through. Do you want to take over the story? Yeah. So, she's sitting eating a dinner at the kitchen table, and this koala just walks in the front door, down the down the passageway, past her, and out the back door, and that like that was its usual usual track before the house was built. So it's still still there. It's like it's amazing how. Um, they don't seem to sense that you know things have changed and that, it, that it, there's possibly danger. There could be a dog. You know, crossing roads is always difficult for them. So um, yeah, it's um, it's kind of endearing, but also quite sad you know, to see that sort of thing. It's a fact that most uh, animals, particularly dog, oh, whales, have had that migration pattern working on the magnetic fields. Mm. Birds work with magnetic fields. Aborigine folklore and so forth talk about the caterpillar trail or the crocodile trail or um, mm. the song lines where they actually uh, follow the path. So, I mean, what you're saying about the koalas makes a lot of sense. Mm. Mm. And you were saying that um, because they're such creatures of habit, if we, you know, the, the government tends to do open up land for development and then they try and offset, so they'll try and um, relocate the koalas to. Mm. A different habitat but you're saying that rarely works because the koalas just tend to you know land in the new place and then they start walking and start trying to get home go and walk about but there's, there's another thing that koalas have got a unique physiology that um one of the things that happens you know the the, the young joeys grow in the in the mother's pouch because you know these animals are marsupials so they grow in there and they they just you know the mother's milk provides all they need and they get to a point where they need to start eating leaf and at this point the mother actually produces this soft fecal pellet and that's got all the bacteria that this baby um, koala needs to to digest um, eucalyptus leaves so this from its mother it gets the the, the microbiome so it can and eat eat the eat the local um, eucalypts that, that so if that animal's moved into another area it may not necessarily be able to digest or adapt so easily to if there's different trees that's apart from the whole territorial nature of the animals when they when they want to come back to to their home their home turf and that was actually how i met you alan um we we both were you were leading an initiative to plant more eucalyptus trees mm. a lot of my friends and neighbors actually will do that that um there's a list of eucalyptus that um we know that the local koalas want to eat Yes, and um, they're diminishing. So, in, and, mm. um, so if you want to help, it's just a matter of planting the right trees at the 
along the back line of your fence. <laughs> yeah, well, so that was. <laughs> <laughs> so one one of the things one of the things we've been looking at, um, and I, I'm not sure what what point it's up to at the moment is that um, we've had uh, specific people are invo involved in forestry looking at whether they can select uh, um, a dwarf eucalypt because eucalypts traditionally in Queensland can grow really big and they, they're a threat if they fall on your house or uh, drop limbs and do all this sort of stuff. So if you could have a dwarf eucalypt planted in your backyard along the back fence line, then you then you then you're actually creating a natural corridor for the animals that can move through. And they'd be very happy. They do they do survive quite well in um, in suburbia, and they're quite happy in their little patch, providing they're not disturbed. Yeah. So we're talking, Alan, about what we can do to help them. Um, you know, obviously pick them up or um, monitor them in your local community. So you know where they do cross the road, mm -hmm. and maybe pr provide protection for them. What what is actually the Queensland government doing, or the local government doing for them? And I know you worked for the local government as an animal welfare officer for quite a long time. So, what we what we're looking at is um, we put a lot of resources into um, the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. Like we provide, we provide hospitals. We've got rescue groups that come and come and pick up animals. So they'll they'll they'll, they'll, they'll get up in the middle of the night and rescue an animal that's been you know that's been hit on the road or you know that someone's very distressed because their dog's dog, which never never bothers anybody, has um, attacked a koala that's come into their backyard. And um, so that's that's one aspect of it. It's like to me, this is treating the symptoms of what, what the problem is. The big issue is the, the total loss of habitat and the fact that we, to provide housing and roads for people, we just seem to have to completely denude the landscape. And once that landscape's gone, it's, it's irreplaceable. Like one of, the, one of the ways we try and justify this is that we'll, we'll provide offsets. So I'm gonna cut down this prime habitat you know, the trees that have taken hundreds of years to grow and I'll let you and the government will let me plant um, some other trees in some other place to offset what I'm doing and so those trees are going to take you know, 100 years to grow properly so the, the the big concern that I have is that we're not sufficiently in tune with the environment to protect the environment and if if we're worried about koalas, we need to protect their habitat. And the current, you know, legislation is we have a lot of rules and regulations about animals and what you can and can't do. But without the trees, the the koalas just not going to survive. So we have to we have to have a an overall view of protecting this this environment. And when we do this to protect the koalas, we're also protecting all the other animals and birds and reptiles and and invertebrates that live in that in that natural environment, but um, it's it's really hard because um, in Australia there's look the traditional um, area where um, koalas were found was all down the east coast of the of this of, of Australia. They weren't they don't occur in Tasmania. They don't occur in Western Australia. They don't live in the tropics. They don't live out in the desert. They live along this coastline and like. The prime koala habitat is where everybody wants to live. Like, eighty percent of human beings in in Australia live along the coastline, within like half an hour of the beach. So, our our relentless pressure is pushing these animals, um, you know, out of out of their natural home. And this is only going to be worsened by um, climate change. There's the the predictions are that the the koala distribution is going to shrink. You know, south, south, southerly, and easterly, because they're just not going to survive out in the in the drier westerly areas. And do you see the government doing anything to stop that happening? I mean, it is our national iconic animal. You know, all the visitors and um, tourists want to see it. Yeah, it's a difficult question. <laughs> um, um, what What's interesting? Some of the some of the latest research, and I think. You've got to give the government credit. Is that they definitely supporting research into this area, and like 
we've you know we can just document this decline like we can just say like we know why it's going down and um so one of the things that people are saying is that the best way that we can protect animals is by integrating them into farming on, onto farms so farmers who looking after the land and and, and are gaining <clears throat> a living off running livestock have also got areas where they can have trees and this is, this is probably an ideal place where we can put koalas and protect them. Mm -hmm. um, they just don't, they're just hopeless at crossing roads. They can't protect themselves against dogs. Um, in, the, in the city, they'll, they'll survive fairly happily in suburbia, but they're also under a lot of threat. Um, and as soon as they're on the ground, they're vulnerable. And they have to get on the ground every so often to go and, and go to another tree to, 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 to get, to get the, the, the leaves that they need. Hey, um, Alan, there was um, a large property um, not all that far from here, 20-something um, acres. And, um, in fact, the farm was quite substantial originally and became a suburb called Shale Park, named after the family. <laughs> so the remaining property that was left, <coughs> the pressure by the council in terms of rates for for those that individual family was the pressure was getting too great. My recommendation to them was to actually rezone <coughs> and give them a new um, zoning and call it um, like an agricultural zone. I mean they can have rural, but something special in the sense that that twenty acres could have been a, a habitat that the council didn't have to pay for because the family knew how to work that property and, mm. and then reduce the rates accordingly because of the, um, and make it more affordable for them to stay on the property, but also the fact that it adjourned um, a daisy or state forest. So mm. there's a big mobs of kangaroos and koalas there. You could always see the possums coming through I mean, and the koalas, I mean. But <clears throat> the council was just looking for the dollar, you know, if, you know forced those original homestead families to sell mm. and move on. And that's what obviously I've seen down here at Pimpamo and the cane farms. So mm. um, yeah, mm. there's too much financial pressure on those individual families to stay on those properties. Mm. Yeah, mm. They need to rezone, mm. bring down the rates. So what you're alluding to there, Jeff, is like we've also got to look at um, connectivity. So if we've got this, got this, spot and it's it's beautiful habitat and it needs to be connected and the fact that it backs onto daisy hill state forest is, is is perfect but if this was in some other part of of this area then we need to look as along especially along creek lines we need the connectivity so the animals can move so that they can you know there's enough animals here that they've, we've got that genetic stability so this is the other thing we we, we can develop our um our new suburbs and and we can have put in new roads providing that we we make some allowance for the wildlife so providing we pro maybe supply an overpass or an underpass underpasses don't work for koalas because if they're on the ground they're, they're vulnerable but um so it's 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 looking creatively how can we create these these corridors and these connections between between these remnants of bush and i guess my real would plead to the government would be like, don't go trashing, you know, the, the, the remnants that we've got. You know, like there's surely there's cleared land already that we can that we can we can build on or <clears throat> or do things with. And I guess it's also a change in attitude, isn't it? It's, you know, mm. the young ones talk about um, what is it, uh, genocide yes. of the environment. And I think to a certain extent they're right, you know, we're just raising down landscapes and environs at the expense of animals and for the for the um, benefit of of humans and you know one of the cases that we were discussing earlier was you know just the caged chickens but that's been under discussion for you know, sort of over two decades and it still hasn't been outlawed and that's mm. simply because when it comes to profit um and feeding humans that you know these the animals just don't seem to get those rights that um, humans do, but if we were to change that and if the population was to say, no, we want to live and be guardians and take the guardianship role of, you know, taking care of the animals that live in our 
in our habitat rather than just taking the land away from them, which is really what we're doing, then um, I think there'd be more cooperation and ability and potential for people to, you know, sort of factor that in when they're planning mm. new new developments and um, create the spaces. Well, I, I think the, the underlying issue is that <clears throat> a lot of people see themselves as separate from nature. They're not part of nature. And when you, when you feel that you're separate, then it's like you become a lot more um, <clears throat> just there for yourself. You become more like as long as you're okay, that's, that's all that matters. And um, what's, what's, what's becoming more and more obvious is that we can't, we can't see ourselves as separate and we can't, we can't hope for a technological fix. You know, this is, I'm mainly talking about um, climate change now. And this is like, we can talk, about koalas but one of the biggest threats for them is, is climate change so the actual chemistry of the gum trees is going to change you know we're going to have more one of these raging bushfires you know and um <clears throat> the the leaves are going to become so nutrient deficient and leathery that the animals are going to have trouble surviving so they'll survive well in zoos and we and we can provide you know um plantations and we can feed them in zoos and they'll, they'll survive well there but they're going to be more and more under stress in, in the environment so basically what we have to do is start looking at, um, at our approach to the natural world and what we're doing to it through through our, our activities so um, this this to me is the underlying uh, the underlying cause for all the issues that that are happening at the moment mm -hmm. And apart from koalas, you've looked at other other animal yeah. species, haven't you? You've, you've been involved in um, projects to rehabilitate, what was it, the hairy nose wombat? Yes. Yeah. But tell us more about that. <laughs> um, this was something that was took me quite by surprise. I, I wasn't aware of it when I first moved to Australia, that um, you, most people know the common wombat. But there are two other species of um, wombat which are much bigger than the common wombat called the the southern hairy nose wombat and the northern hairy nose wombat, and in the some time in the eighties, um, a little, a small group of these northern hairy nose wombats were found in in central Queensland, and at that time they were rarer than than the panda. You know, like everybody gets yeah. really, whereas these these guys are in Queensland. They're on a back doorstep, and no one's paying them much attention because, in one way, because they they dig these massive burrows, which, you know, sometimes you can fall into a hole, you know, it's more than, than two, two metres. So it's quite, they're quite a, um, they cause problems <laughs> if you're a farmer. Um, <clears throat> and so um, by, by running, I don't know if there is a northern hairy nose there, one of these bigger ones here, yeah. um, by, by, um, <clears throat> What, what we what we were involved with was we, there was this this group of um, a few hundred on a on a farm. So it was the area was turned into a national park, and, and it was seen to be very very vulnerable. Uh, that's you're getting them down the bottom there now. I think. Um, so the the plan plan from the government was to set up a second colony. So we at the time we were trapping trapping these animals and. Um, and, and looking at them, but we didn't know how they would handle um, being moved. So this is this is an amazing thing. You've got these really rare animals. They've never they've always just lived in this one little spot, and we're going to take them and put them. You know, we move them down to St George, um, and you know by flying them there, and we didn't even know if they would would handle you know going in the plane. So um, it was really quite um, nerve wracking to do it, but it was also very re rewarding once we got them. To this other area, and, and we could start the second colony because otherwise, you know, it would just take one natural disaster, and that whole the whole population on the planet could disappear just that that easily. Mm. I saw that. It was on uh, mm. ABC or SBS. Yeah, Flight of the Wombats. Yeah, yeah. I was interviewed in that movie, so yeah, mm. it's mm. good. Eh? Yeah, yeah. No, it was pretty, pretty incredible. No, I know where I saw it. Mm. Daisy Hill. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Ended up there. Yeah. yeah, it was really good. And they're, they're actually, those wombats actually related to koalas. So. Yeah, yeah, they're the, the closest relatives to koalas. And um, the, the, 
the fascinating thing I found out about um, these northern hairy nose wombats is that they've got this incredible me metabolic rate. That the, the the big advantage for them is that if they're living um, underground, they've got a constant environment, so they're not under any pressure. Like the humidity is constant, the temperatures temperatures constant, and because their digestive system is incredibly efficient, they can just go down there and sit there like we were trying to trap them. And, and we were only legally allowed to, to trap them for like three or four days. Yeah, that's a great picture. Um, that um, And so they can just go and sit in their burrow and go, you know, we don't care. <laughs> you do what you want. So, yeah, it was quite quite difficult to actually catch the animals um, that we wanted. Mm -hmm. But um, And so the next the next phase of this whole project is like, can we get, can we get another bigger area? Because the, the area we've moved to them is a bit uh, limited. And can we get them back out into the wild? You know, uh, but they they tend to live in semi-arid areas. They um, and one of the, the issues is because they're a grazing animal, they they need a variety of um, natural natural plants. And in a lot of the a lot of the areas where they're found, there's the buffalo grass is taking over, and it just it's not not really good um, nutrition for for the wombats. And this is one of the areas where you, you know we've been talking about we were talking about regenerative agriculture. That there's a new trend for that, and mm, um, mm. that some farmers, and this is worldwide, I'm sure, just can't deal with all the um, paperwork and the costs and the fees, and even the subsidies won't get them going. So some of them have just been turning over their land to be completely rewilded, which mm. I think is something that's being um, trialed in New Zealand as well, rewilding whole habitats in order to reverse the loss of uh, original native species so one, one of the one of the things i've been following in new zealand which i really really like it's called predator free new zealand and i think this is a brilliant initiative um because and like this is a, this could be a whole nother <laughs> talk about the effect of feral animals on the australian environment but in new zealand the int introduction of possums has been absolutely disastrous to to the wildlife and to to the environment um, we've got stoats and, and those kind of mustelids, which are incredibly efficient killers that are out there attacking um, birds. And so I don't know where the initiative came from, but, you know, they want to, the New Zealand government wants, wants to get rid of rats, mice, um, um, possums. possums, hedgehogs and, and all the mustelids. But so I, was, I actually volunteered a couple of years ago to go to Lord Howe Island because there's um, 1913 or something, a ship was wrecked on Lord Howe Island and all the ship rats got onto the island and they were causing havoc with the, the native wildlife there. And so they were actually bringing expertise from New Zealand to Lord Howe because New Zealand leads the world in, um, in protecting, um, well, in r removing all these all these feral animals from, from islands and they've been very successful in doing that. So that expertise was taken over to Lord Howe. Um, Australia's also had an amazing impact on Macquarie Island, which is between here and Antarctica. Yeah. So I think I've got off the subject a little bit. <clears throat> yeah. Sorry. So, yeah. So that was rewilding. And, yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, and uh, the, the habitat can actually recover quite quickly, by mm. all accounts, if, if you just stop farming and do nothing. Mm. There are butterfly species coming in that haven't been seen before, etc. Mm. Well, there's a, there's a particular example of this guy in the UK that's done that, and um, um, it's just phenomenal what's the changes that have occurred and the interest that it's, that it's caught. And, like, there's people coming from all over the planet now, to, well, before COVID, um, to, to actually come and visit this place where this guy has just let nature do its thing. And I think that's, to me... This is why we've got to stop interfering in the environment um, if we want to we want to we want to protect koalas and other Australian wildlife. Um, one of the big issues here, of course, is that a lot of the the smaller marsupials are really susceptible to feral cats, foxes, um, and that's 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 a major major concern. So we're seeing um, people like the Australian Wildlife um, Conservancy um, putting up these barrier fences and getting rid of the Getting rid of the feral animals inside, and then then the, the wildlife can it's got a chance of actually coming back. 
And what, what we're starting to realise is just the, um, the environmental impact that those animals have, like turning over the soil um, and, and just how it can actually promote the regeneration of the, the natural environment. Hey, um, I'm going to take over the conversation here. Uh, I just want to go back to developers. And some uh, six years ago, I got the invitation to go down to our Logan Community Bank and um, the usual suspects turned up. And we had a property developer. And it was really interesting to hear him say that how many of you guys made money when you sold your home? That's an interesting question. He said, now, when you bought your original homes, you had no infrastructure. You had to go and put in your concrete driveways. You probably had bed sheets hanging in your, in your windows. Um, but now, as a developer, we have to put in all the headworks, underground sewage and water and power. <clears throat> and then um, it comes back to the fact that we've only got X amount of square metres to work with to actually sell a block, to actually recover our, our funds. So we can actually sell 70% of our property before we actually break even. Then he said, um, we're now talking about did you notice there's something not wrong here? You there? Yeah. Okay, something's not right. Um, anyway, so he was saying um, to purchase a property now, he was telling me, or telling us, council fees, state fees, the government fees, federal government with the GST in there. And then came up and said, what do you think we have to pay in all of those outgoings before? We can put a markup, a margin on the property at the site. I was quite surprised. This three hundred and ninety thousand bloody home had eighty five thousand attributed to those costs for councils and the state government and the federal government. That's a lot of money. So when developers start taking on board aspects of what we're talking about today, there has to be some flexibility in terms of of any one of those three um, government infrastructures. To give them some freedom and some um, latitude as to what type of development. They've come up with a concept that they had to come up with a house that was for granny flat and then the normal house. And so that become a succession through the whole three families. When I say three generations of families, so grandma, grandpa, then they pass over, kids come through, they go into grandpa and grandpa's house. And then Eventually, mum and dad move into grandma's grandma's house and the kids, whatever, take over the family home. So, recycles. So then, then we go to the next part of that's humanity doing development. Then we go out to the Darling Downs there where we see all these um, oil and gas and fracking and all that stuff. Causes so much repairable damage to the artesian basin. And then we get a premier of, of Queensland, who's a labour guy at the time, going in and and uh, filling up all the uh, water wells, uh, artesian wells, so that our livestock or even our nature animals ha haven't got a normal concourse to go through to actually go and get the water hole because it's now being blocked up by man in terms of their fracking. Then we go to the next part of my conversation, what I call, I consider to be the legend of this whole subject just before I mm -hmm. and the guy's called Peter Andrews. Mm. Mm. You know, he should be knighted 10 times yes, over. Yes. Peter Andrews, amazing guy. Um, the sacrifice that his family went through to be able to do what he did and then get kicked to the curb by successive government bureaucracy. And thank God Jerry Harvey and Richard Platt, the billionaire bloke, mm -hmm. came to the rescue there to mm. give that, give his concept of actually regeneration um, property and exactly where this conversation is going on. This is the guy. Mm. Imagine, isn't it? Yes, um, yes, amazing. Right. So, for yep. people overseas who don't know what Peter Andrews is doing, what is he doing? You've got that picture there to go from. Well, he showed you that. To restored landscapes. So, keeping the water on the land is not. Mm. Yeah. It's the essence of it. Mm. So, his concept defeated all those bureaucracies who went to academic schools of learning. He came with basically lifestyle experiences. So his game plan was, yeah, see that arid ground there, we just keep on planting it and all that stuff. But what actually happens is they're breaking down the trees 
and then the creeks dry up. So his first thing was to regenerate the creeks. So either you throw down rocks or you throw down timbers, which is natural, and they start creating little pools of water. When you get the pools of water, then you start getting other insects come along, and then the insects then start bringing in other forms of the of the cycle of other predators. And before you know it, you start bringing in the, the grasses. And he said, you, when you get the weeds, you keep the weeds, and then you let them grow to have a tall, and you just come from come along, and you just you cut, but you don't go down to the roots. You just make sure you've got a stubble. And the remnants that you've cut stay on the ground and it starts building up some humus. And it just carries on and builds up, builds up. And, you know, before you lie, you've got a restored landscape. I mean, the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Commission, did a show on it called Australian Story. And they showed you the photos of properties for miles and miles and miles, kilometres, square kilometres, miles, thousands. Just up there on the left-hand yeah, side, yeah, Barry. And, and then you come into these two valleys, one owned by Jerry Harvey and the other one by Richard Pratt, lush green. It just showed you how you can do it naturally without a, a, a ton of money there. And thanks to Jerry Harvey educating the bureaucrats, this guy, I, I consider him to be the, the man of, of, the now, of the hour. Mm. It sounds like you know the guy as well. Yeah, well, I've, yeah I've read a lot about him, man, but... Also, it's like you talk to his neighbours and they'll they'll think he's a, a nutter, and this is the same same experience that happened in um, in the UK where this guy rewilded his property. He was he was struggling to make a living out of it, and yet his neighbours were still saying he was obliged to farm that land, and um, and so like the whole issue is that we can't continue in this way. And that if we keep Keep going the way we're going. We're gonna we're gonna run out of topsoil. We're gonna run out of um, the ability to to feed ourselves. So, and the, does the population of the planet is still increasing? So we need to be a bit, a bit more careful about how we how we um, grow our food. And and I think part of that steward what we're talking about is stewardship. Is that once we do start to take care of the land, then we can start taking taking care of the the, the wildlife and if we're talking about regenerative agriculture it's amazing that um, <clears throat> farmers can dedicate 30 percent of their land to um, you know re revegetation and still make a profit and actually make more do do better out of it than if they just just had these bare paddocks and so I just see like um, one of the big issues you know you see like with people struggling on the land is like is mental health and, and the suicide rate. And when you, when you have this connection with nature, when you're doing these sort of things, it's amazing how you become more, you know, it just, it just settles you down. And I think we've got this innate human need to actually feel connected and to be part of nature. Mm -hmm. And um, the way we're going now is we, we're destroying it for, for whatever reason, mainly for profit, and um, and like you know, like Julia, before you were talking about you know ecocide or you know genocide of the natural environment, I see that as, as like suicide for for the human beings. Like the right the way we're going. And one of the interesting things I had when I was looking at um, epidemiology is that because we're um, encroaching on on the habitat of the of a lot of native species. The, the, the viruses and the, and the other microorganisms that are in those animals, that's, that's where we're getting exposed. So that's probably where coronaviruses come from. That's, that's where um, HIV came from. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's so many records now. They, they're saying in the future 80% of the new infectious diseases are going to come out of wildlife just because we're, we're, we're so meshed with them now. We don't, they don't have their own space. You know, we're encroaching on their space so much more. And as a, as a, as a vet, one of your things when you were looking at animal welfare was actually, um, you said you can actually measure whether an animal's stressed or not. And, mm. you know, the koalas are obviously all getting, um, mm. what is it, chlamydia? And, you were, yeah. and apparently that's, that's not because <laughs> well, they're not doing anything different. It's just that it's a stress factor for them. Well, we've got a, you've got a really good example here in Queensland. There's, there's an island called St. Bees where um, researchers have been there and, and they're studying the population there. And they've 
they've recorded that these animals are carrying chlamydia, but um, they're not. It's not manifesting as disease. So the the the, the bugs there. It's a, like it's chlamydia are quite an unusual um, type of organism because they they live inside the cells in the chrylus, and it's and I, I I like to use this example of like a like a triangle that. Um, Disease is a is an interaction between um, the the organism, the animal, and the environment. And if that triangle gets skewed, then then disease manifests. And this is what's actually happening um, in southeast Queensland now is that because the, the animals are stressed because of their habitats but disappearing, we're seeing a hell of a lot more chlamydia. <clears throat> so the the approach now is that, oh, we should be vaccinating all these animals <clears throat> against chlamydia. So, um, again, I just see see that as like we're treating the symptoms again and we're not getting at the actual underlying cause. And so to me it's like, well, so you've got an animal that's that's vaccinated against chlamydia and it's not going to be disease. It's still going to be stressed. So some other some other, something else is going to happen with that. So... Um, this, to me, this is the, this is the whole issue that um, we're just uh, upsetting the balance. And once that balance is upset, it's really difficult to, to restore it. Mm. No, I'd actually like to check in on that in terms of animals being stressed. I know when you were in New Zealand, you were, um, at that time, New Zealand was still exporting, doing live exports of sheep, which I mm. think Australia is still doing. Mm. And I know that's a bit of a contentious issue at the moment. Mm. As a vet, you you were tasked to go onto the ship with the mm. sheep from all the way from New Zealand to three weeks, East, yeah, for three weeks. Mm. Tell, tell us what actually happened. Where did you go? Bend over that, okay, Uh Saudi Arabia went to Saudi. Rio, 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 yeah, Jeddah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what what I found fascinating about this is like these animals were going for the Hajj, so they're going to be slaughtered and then given given to the poor. So they had to be intact male animals. So they had tails and they still had their testicles. And one of the big issues was um, with these, the, the ships we were on, we had like 125,000 sheep on this converted oil tanker. And what where they used to have the oil, um, there was just all these pallets for feeding the sheep. And then above deck, there was, you know, a number of, number of different levels of, of sheep. So providing the ship was moving, there was adequate ventilation for the, for the sheep. As soon as it stopped, which was what happens when you get into the Red Sea and you get these what's called a hot fog, the animals can't lose um, can't lose heat and they'll die of you know of heat stress. But um, the interesting thing for me because I'm I was really fascinated by animal behaviour is that the animals very quickly get adapted to. The sound of the 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 augers get turned on, and they know that the food's going to arrive at the trough. So all the big boys go and, and gorge themselves at the trough. The other guys, they, the, the the smaller ones, they can't they can't get any access to the trough. So the subordinate sh um, sheep were dying from starvation. You know, they just you'd open them up, and it was like their whole intestinal system being scrubbed clean. There was just nothing in there because they were being prevented from eating by by these other sheep, and that was something that we hadn't really detected before. And it's just an, just another example of like, why are we exporting animals for slaughter when, when we could just, you know, we could slaughter them near where they grow and then and send, send them meat. And right, um, you're talking about claws and shipping that because they're the specialists mm. and um, livestock. But um, mm. look, I happened to be in Cairo some years ago, staying there, and um, they treated us um, with some sort of celebrity status, so we had to put in um, 35 Egyptian pounds. And um, uh, one of the males went down to the um, Wait, options man. there and brought a live um, ewe, <laughs> brought it back uh, to the property, and then um, they got a halal uh, butcher in and um, was slaughtered on site. They hung it up in the, the doorway. They then got a barbecue plate out and they brought out a, um, a stand up um, a fan mm -hmm. so they could get some breeze to get the coals going. 
and then they started to strip out the meat and then they had the whole family and they just came out and laid out all these carpets on the earth and that and then because we were the overseas people that they were giving us the tenderloins you know of the uh, best part of the meat cuts then the men were fed and then the women were fed and the children were fed it was just a sense of sense of order you know but it was their way of customs and culture about hmm. having something live that um that could say the prayers and the hell out aspect to it yeah and it's fresh yeah exactly hmm. right so hmm. there is something to be said for it i mean um in the avatars that i've seen in australia and new zealand yeah they get the um muslim kill guys to come in and, and do the um the slaughter at a certain time frame when they get and the rabbis yeah mm-hmm. so rabbis so for the jewish yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. there's one rabbi guy came into australia and he he did his job and ran off so they had to go and track him down <laughs> he wanted to stay in australia so um yeah so uh it, it's there's a whole sense of process there when it comes to uh customs isn't it you, mm. you try to treat very rarely eh? But this is the question, you know, that's for the humans, that, you know, uh, um, if you, you know, and you've obviously done behavioural science and you, you can measure how stressed the animals are, so you've been into feedlots, what have you, what have you detected? Um, well, one of my first jobs when I came to Queensland was um, was looking at heat stress and, and uh, feedlots, and at that time there was a, a lot of animals dying, and Often they were English bred, you know, like um, Angus cattle that have got a black coat, and they're standing out in this feedlot, no shade, and the temperature's really high, and they've got no no way of um, of moving out, moving out of that feedlot. So um, now now they've they've got you know they put misters and and um, they put up shade cloth and things like that, but. Um, the whole, to me, the whole intensification of animal production is where we're just causing a lot of problems. We're causing a lot of contamination of the environment. Um, we're producing cheap food, but um, I'd really question, like, the quality of that food when you eat it. Like, um, you can look at marbling scores and all that, and it's pretty, it's, it's pretty good. But um, to, to me, there's there's been a lot of work. Look, just looking at like grass fed is probably better better for us. Um, and again, it's this thing of like quality, not quantity. Um, the industrialization of food production is really causing so many issues for us at the moment. And um, I think that that's just one aspect of it: the feedlot cattle and uh, the um, cage. Cage chickens are just just one example of it, or two examples of it. Oh, I think I mean they put hormonal stuff into their feet. And... Yeah, well, look, these these animals are designed to to graze over vast distances to eat eat um, high fiber diets, and and we're feeding them on grains, you know, and that that grain could easily be fed directly to human beings. You know, it's it's an inefficient process, um, but um, it's pretty well established in <laughs> in Queensland, that's for sure. <clears throat> Yeah, because then um, with our wheat and all that stuff, and they store it, and all of a sudden we have um, locusts and we have um, mice, right? Uh, mice um, mm. plagues, and so they put the whole um, silos into ammonium sulfate, and so um, mm. when it gets covered in the, the the shell and all that stuff, and they try and wash it off, they just can't mm. get the, um, that um, ammonium sulfate off, and of course then people say you got gluten. No, you <laughs> you're not gluten intolerant. You're ammonium sulfate intolerant. So I. I guess one of the point I do want to make is that you see it in any intensive farming and like, you know, like Tasmanian salmon's a big issue at the moment here. Um, but like the same happens on piggeries. That when you when you crowd all these animals together, <coughs> they, the chance of transmission of disease is much higher. And so um, the animals aren't living in a natural environment. They can't get away from each other. And so... Rather than us changing the environment to suit the animal, we change change the animal. Like we de beat chickens when they're, when they're in cages, so they don't peck each other. We cut the tails off piglets, so they don't they don't attack each other. Um, these these sort of things happen, and I I just feel like there can be a much more compassionate and humane way of, of actually producing producing food. Well, you have to go into the uh, the mystical world 
and um, become a breatharian. So, you know, it's the case of meditating and as the sun rises and you take the sun through your eyes and you take in the light. And I know a number of people have been able to do that and just drink water or a sort of like a soup based um, for food and they uh, had remarkable bloody health issues being healed and they've become quite high vibrant beings, you know. I'm just throwing out a remedy there. <laughs> so as a proportion of the population, Jeff, how many, how many are breatharians? <laughs> that would be like the guy Peter Andrews, you know. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. The next one they were saying, you can't believe it. But anyway, there's yeah. so, <coughs> you just um, need but, someone to step forward to say, hey, there's another opportunity here, another way of looking at it. Don't you? Well, I, I just think it's like um, the answer is that we'd have to change the way we think about things. And I think at the moment it's, it's so easy to stay in the old, the old sort of ruts of oh this is the way we do it and this is the way it has to be done, and um, you know this is what I think this is where I feel so optimistic about the younger generation and particularly the school kids that are out protesting about um, uh, global warming things like that is that people are starting to look you know in an innovative way is what we're doing and why we're doing it and do we have to keep doing it this way just because we because we always have. Well, it goes back to distribution, isn't it, and warehousing and, and uh, how it's marketed, isn't it? So uh, that's what we learned from our gentleman who came from the body shop to get the farmers to come together and set up a cooperative so um, yep. they can actually maintain a, a good value for their product and also look after the distribution channels. Unfortunately, uh, greed takes over and someone from the ASX or NASDAQ or whatever comes along and says, mm. look, we can give you a shitload of money as a cooperative and we'll turn you into a a corporation and of course dairy farmers have done that and then they've got wiped out with uh, cheap milk. Yeah, but I think there's also, you know, apart from farmers, you know, that more and more people are growing food in the backyards or setting up community gardens or, you know, Alan's been involved in um, turning um, old farms into back into native bushland. So there's, you know, huge, 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 uh, huge, uh, Groundswell of people actually taking action mm. and, and doing that, and um, I think that's definitely something that we have to do. We have to get more hands on. I think just donating money to charities who will adopt a koala isn't going to do stuff because they just end up adopting koalas that are already in zoos. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, rather than solving our cultures, we really have to take care of our backyards, you know, go out mm. and look at the wildlife, see where it lives. Um, get to know it, support it, and um, then occasionally do other things like Alan does, which is like go up to Gladstone Harbour, <laughs> jump off a boat, try and catch a turtle, <laughs> and relocate it. Can you tell us about that? I just love that story. Um, well, no, again, it's like getting into this whole issue of um, you know marine pollution now. But um, so we've got. We've got one amazing guy that's spent his whole life studying turtles in, in Queensland, and he's tagged turtles like 30 years ago and seen them come back. Um, but um, th again, the issue with um, <clears throat> global warming is that um, the sex of, of turtles is determined by the temperature of the eggs when they're, when they're incubating. So what we're finding now is that as the temperatures are rising, that there's, there's no males, male turtles being, being born. So people have actually have, are starting to try and cool down some of these um, turtle nests so that some male um, turtles can be born. But So part of, part of the research that I was involved with was going to Gladstone, which is a major industrial um, um, harbour. And in the, in the harbour, I'm not quite sure what the term was, but the Gladstone Harbour group were, were, were um, doing a survey to see what was happening. With the, with the the turtles in the in the Gladstone Harbour, and the job that we we're involved with was going out and catching turtles, weighing them, tagging them, and also um, looking inside them to see, you know, because if if they're not fully grown, you can't decide whether they're a male or a female, and then if they were, um, and just looking to see whether their reproductive systems were active. So we just and at the same time there was another university student there um, looking at heavy metals and things in, like, in the blood of these animals just to try to get an idea of what's going on. So um, there's a lot of 
like I say, a lot of we're, we're gathering a lot of data, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're actually doing a lot to actually change the situation. So, <clears throat> but maybe coming back to the koala. Um, so, if you, if people who are watching it locally in Brisbane, Southeast Queensland, if they do find a koala that looks lost crossing the road or is orphaned, Alan, where do they take it to? <laughs> Well, I think the, the key message is don't try and pick it up. You'll, you'll get, you'll get um, ripped to shreds if you do. Um, so there are what what's amazes me is that, that there's so many volunteer groups in, um, in, in Queensland which, which um, will, are on call 24-7 you know, to go and, 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 and care for wildlife. So um, the, the one I'm most familiar with is the Ipswich Koala Protection Society. So... They've, they've got people that'll go out and um, pick up um, animals off if they've been injured on the road or if uh, if they're in someone's backyard and they've been attacked by a dog or if they're showing signs of um, <clears throat> of chlamydia, they'll, they'll go out and they can set a trap around the tree and, and, and collect that animal and then take it for treatment. But um, sadly, what we found, like, with over 90% of the animals that are attacked by dogs, they... They never rec recover. Their injuries are so bad. Um, so, and often that's the case with uh, animals hit by cars. That if they've got a broken jaw, um, it's very difficult to get that jaw aligned because the, the the grinding of the leaves is so precise and has to be so so fine that if the if the koala's jaw is slightly out of out of alignment, then they're not going to be able to survive in the wild. Mm -hmm. But the whole issue with um, the rescue of wildlife is to return them to the wild. So they, they'll be taken into care. There's a number of wildlife hospitals in southeast Queensland, and um, those animals are then um, returned. They're, they're microchips, so we can we can identify them if they come back in, and then they're released back to the, to the natural habitat if, if they can be. And then just to summarise, as we're coming to the end of the show, and you've been listening to Alan McKinnon, um, eucalyptus or you know, take care of your backyard, get shiny animals there along the fence. That's, that's what you're saying as well. Yeah, but I'd say don't, don't just focus on.